And it's 10 a.m. right here in Lagos, Nigeria. Good morning, good evening, wherever in the world you're watching from. It's Business Morning Live on Channels Television. I'm Ladi Williams. First off, let's take a look at the markets. We see oil prices uh, climb this fears of demand downturn in China, eased after Shanghai uh, released release some uh, COVID-19 related restrictions. And OPEC warned it would be impossible to increase output enough to offset a lost Russian supply. Brent crude futures were up uh, $1.72 uh, to $100.20 a barrel, and U.S. West Texas intermediate crude uh, was up uh, $1.76 to $96.05 uh, a barrel. Both contracts had settled down around 4% uh, on Monday. I said on Monday that more than 7,000 residential units had been classified as lower risk areas after reporting uh, no new infections for 14 days and its uh, districts have since been announcing that specific compounds uh, can be opened up. And back here, the relief on interest income schemes, a new uh, incentive package introduced by the Nigerian Export Promotion Council, amongst other incentives targeted at improving non-oil export in the country. The federal government has continuously encouraged manufacturers to uh, access the scheme, which aims at stimulating banks' grant credit facilities for export. The executive director of the council, Mr. Ezra Yaksak, and his team were uh, in some factories in Kano State, Northwest Nigeria, to assess the level of implementation of the scheme. Do take a listen. Officials of the Nigeria Export Promotion Council on an assessment tour of the businesses of some manufacturers who benefited from its intervention as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic amid its diverse incentive windows which targets boosting non-oil export. The intervention offer ranges from 50 million naira to 300 million naira. Uh, there was an intervention by federal government under the economic sustainability program most of these companies were given different grants under the COVID relief grant uh, and different amount of money was given to these companies uh, of course since this government is not just free money we have to come here to inspect the facility to see whether that money was judiciously utilized he's excited at the level of the utilization of funds and speaks of the impact on the economy I know the number of jobs that have been saved here, and new jobs have been, uh, uh, people have been employed. And like some companies now, some of them that we visited, we have some of them have 8,000 uh, uh, employees, some 206, some 8,000, uh, depending on their capacity. While some of the exporters are grateful for the intervention, others want more funding. The COVID relief, we have, uh, we, have, uh, we have gotten something there, and it has helped during the COVID, after the COVID, for us to pay some of our salaries in order for us not to sack our workers. It helped us uh, at least to cover uh, somehow the losses and lack of uh, business, and, uh, you know, we've been taking care also of our workers' staff and maintenance throughout the period when uh, the COVID-19 was so effective. Uh, on us, I mean, uh, business-wise and, uh, and, and generally everything. So it actually helped us. We utilized it in, in, in trying to pick ourselves up and hopefully, you know, go back to where we were before and even improve on that with time. Some of the companies visited with manufacturers of hides and skin, confectionaries, shoes and bags, all made in Nigeria goods for export, which translates to sustainable economic development. And now to our first conversation. The month of April is recognized as National Financial Literacy Month, aimed at helping raise awareness about the importance of financial education, encourage uh, users to take a holistic look at their financial environment, focusing on the areas of education, financial wellness, and uh, work and career. Personal finances at home and new investments are also uh, in focus. To break it down, we have uh, Luatosi Olasende, founder, Money Africa. Joining us on the program. Good morning. Hi, good morning. How are you? I'm fine. Great to have you. Well, it's Financial Literacy Month. Tell us the significance, you know, of this you know, month set aside for uh, awareness on, on financial education. All right. So basically, financial literacy forms a critical core of people. So this awareness is to let people know that financial education is very important and people should actually be practicing it. It's like a reminder knowing that there's a huge cost that comes with a lack of 
financial literacy, and it is very, very important for us to be promoting it. Right, and we keep, you know, hearing about financial liter literacy. How do you get financially literate, you know, and how, what's the uh, significance of it to a, a time like this? You know, we're seeing rising inflation. Everything is uh, going up at this point. Fantastic. So basically, the difference between a financial literate person and a person that is not financial literate is very high. For something as simple as, oh, if I have a health insurance, I don't have to pay out of my pocket if I fall ill, right? If I buy in bulk, you know, it's cheaper and I'll be able to use it over a period of time. Now, talking about the role that inflation is playing, there is only so much an individual can do. Now, you're thinking to yourself, there is currently inflation, the price of food has significantly gone up. How do we manage or how do we persevere through this all? Definitely something has to give. One would have to start giving up what people consider as luxury goods. So you start focusing on the things that you need to survive. Those will be the things that will take up your priority list. And if there's anything left over, then you can consider your luxury items. Yeah. Quite interesting. And uh, obviously, it, this impacts, you know, investing uh, the decisions. I saw you posted, you know, recently you talked about why Nigerians uh, love Ponzi schemes. Why did you say that? I think the thing is, many people do not realize the patience that comes with investing, right? Investing is a long-term game. Many times people reach out to Money Africa and they say, Toto, what will I get in three months? Toto, what will I get in six months? That's not how it works. For people to invest, it's like sowing a seed, right? You have to be patient. You have to water it. You have to take care of it. You have to play a long-term game. Now, there are three different categories of investing. You have your short-term investing. You have your medium-term investing. You have your long-term investing. But in Nigeria, a lot of people pay so much attention to short-term and they want miracles. They want 50% in a month. Definitely, that's definitely going to be a Ponzi scheme because you hardly find a legitimate business that is scalable in large quantities that will give you 50% in just one month. So when people start understanding that investing is a long-term game, you have to be patient, you have to sow the seed, you have to be patient, then you'll be able to start investing in the right investment instruments. And yeah, there, there are quite a number of schemes, you know, uh, out there right now. How do you identify the, the scams, you know, at this point? Because, you know, everybody's trying to make some money there. All right. How do you identify a Ponzi scheme scam? Number one, start asking yourself, if it is too good to be true, then it is too good to be true. Inflation in Nigeria as of today, the most recent number, let's even say about 15%, right? If somebody is promising you Anything multiplied by three in a year, you should start being worrisome, right? It's a, it's a trigger mark for you. So anybody promising you more than 50% in six months, in one year, start worrying, and they guarantee it. Now, it could happen. There are some businesses that grow really fast, but you cannot guarantee it. So if they're saying, I guarantee you 50% in six months, 50% in one year, start being worrisome. Number two, you cannot explain the business model. Now, if somebody tells you about a Ponzi scheme, you're asking them, how do you make money? And they cannot explain it. That's a big problem. Number three, if you have to bring other people into the business for it to be successful, we have a problem. The business should be able to succeed on its own. You do not need to always have to find three people, bring five people, bring 10 people. Those are some signs of Ponzi. So in summary, if it's too good to be true, if the return is three times multiplied by the inflation rate, and if it's dependent on you continuously bringing new people, then we have a problem. Those are some signs to look out for. Quite, quite interesting. And, you know, globally, we're seeing inflation uh, rise and, you know, central bankers, you know, warning of more aggressive uh, rate hikes. We're seeing, you know, the equities markets, that's getting uh, rattled, you know, globally. But we've seen, you know, commodities go up. But, uh, you know, for you, what should investors, you know, be, be looking at at this time? Because some of them would just want to sit on their money. You know, you don't want to lose uh, money when you go into the stock market at this point. Fantastic. Whenever a market is, is going through a um, crisis like that, people always take their pull back, right? And that's why whenever you see the market is being turbulent, many people invest in safe instruments, instruments like gold, right? Many people go towards safety because the market is turbulent. They don't know what's going on. They'd rather just sit back. So my advice to a lot of people is, number one, think long term, right? 
Many people underestimate what's going to happen in 10 years and overestimate what's going to happen in one year. So we always advise our community members, people that join Money Africa, that play a long-term game. Do not be too worried about what's happening today. Be thinking about the next five years. Look for how to smoothen out your investment. Now, also start looking at a different risk profile. You have your low risk things like your money market mutual fund, things like investing in gold, things that are safe or low risk in nature. Many people like to go towards this angle during you know, a turbulent time or where there's a lot of uncertainty. Now you also have your medium risk, which has the stock market you know, and other kind of instruments. Now, balancing, balancing, balancing. So even if you want to go into an instrument like the stock market or other things that have risk profile, you're going into it not with both feet. You're only allocating a portion of your investment there. You're not putting all your money into it. So, yeah. But for, for you, what, what's the best uh, portfolio mix, you know, at a time with so much uncertainty? Fantastic. Now, the thing is this, there's no best portfolio mix. We always look at the individual. So for instance, let's look at Chioma. Chioma is 30 years old. She's single. She doesn't have kids. Um, she does not have a lot of um, family burden. Chioma, in this case, can take a little bit of risk, right? She's young. She's not sending money back home to her parents or she's not raising her children through school. So you can see that there's a little bit more liberty here. If she wants to do 50-50, meaning that 50% in low risk, 50% in high risk, because of her age and the lack of dependence, it's possible for her to do that. Now let's look at uh, Mohammed. Mohammed is 40, he has three children, you know, his kids are in school, he's sending money back home to his parents, he will not invest like Chioma. So the whole essence of the scenario is that there is no best investment portfolio. What matters most is that person, their responsibility, where they are currently in their life, their age, and things like that. We always advise younger people that they have opportunity to take more risk because they are young, they can make the money back. But people that are on the older side, we tell them to be a little bit more conservative. Right, so they do not expose themselves to too much risk. Yeah. Yeah, and talking about yeah risk, you know, we've seen a lot of attention go to the uh, crypto space. That that that's been giving some kind of you know huge returns to some people, but obviously a lot of people also you know lose money uh, in that market because of how uh, volatile it is. How do you see the uh, crypto space as an investment? I'm going to be very honest. When I first heard about the cryptocurrency and all of that, I was a bit, um, um, against it is a very strong word. I was a bit conservative. I, I wasn't, uh, I didn't understand it. And just like with financial literacy, you have to understand it before you invest in it. Now things have changed. In 2018, I made my first investment in cryptocurrency. I had a better understanding of it. Now it's a highly volatile asset, right? And there are some good projects there and there are also some, some faulty projects there. There are many cryptocurrency projects that go short, you know, within a year, they take people's money and then they disappear. So you have to do a lot of things like due diligence, are you also sticking to the bigger names like your Bitcoin, Ethereum, and all these other bigger projects than the smaller ones? And even if you want to go into it again with risk, you have to ask yourself, how much am I willing to part with? This is a highly risky, um, this is a volatile market. So how much am I putting into it? Somebody can say, I want to expose 5% of my portfolio in cryptocurrency. Another person can say, I want to put in 25% of my of my portfolio in cryptocurrency. The biggest mistake that a lot of investors make is they're either taking too much risk or they're taking too little risk. So we always advise, do everything with caution. You know, do not overly expose yourself to just one instrument. So in summary, cryptocurrency is here to stay. Do your research and do not overly expose yourself. I always tell people, if you have 100 Naira and somebody came, comes and take five Naira from you, will you lose sleep over it? It will pain you, but you will not lose sleep. But imagine you have 100 Naira, somebody comes and boxes you and they take 80 Naira away from you. Of course, you'll be upset. You won't be able to sleep. That's like 80% of your entire money. So that's how you actually consider this things. Yeah, and you know, still looking at that space, you know, another uh, uh, segment is growing, the metaverse, you know, space, you're seeing uh, uh, digital lands, digital art. And, you know, I'm wondering, is this a viable investment? Okay, so how does, it, how does investment work? It's very interesting. It is demand and supply. 
every time there's a demand and supply for a market, that market is going to exist. Can you remember during lockdown when we had those poor bearers from Ghana carrying the coffin and dancing and it went viral? They were able to sell the NFT of that video for one million US dollars. How did they do that? They did it on NFT. Who would have thought five years ago that somebody would be able to sell a short, less than one minute video of people carrying a coffin dancing for a million dollars? So as long as there is a demand and supply, that market is going to continue to exist. It will stop to exist if there are not going to be players there. So if there's a supply and nobody's demanding for it, then we are going to see that place crash. And really, that's what's going to determine if the metaverse is going to be here to stay or not. So it all depends on uh, demand okay, at this point. But all right, let's look at you know something else. Now you know you know someone some people not familiar with you know the financial world, they have to choose, you know, quite a number of financial products, you know, that you know should suit that. But we also see that people normally go with, you know, what's in, you know, what maybe their parents use. You know, what's your advice for for someone like that? My number one advice, and many people underestimate it, is financial literacy. It's until one people have gotten burnt that they start taking the, take, they start stepping back. Let me give you a good example. A person is retiring. All their life, they've been a teacher. They receive their pension, and immediately they put it into a business. They understand nothing about it. Of course, it's going to crash. So many people go into businesses. Many people make investment decisions without understanding it. The knowledge is very important. So. Instead of that rush, step back, understand it. For instance, what is a money market mutual fund? You need to be able to understand how it works. A money market mutual fund consists of low risk instruments, things like treasury bills, government bonds. The aim is for it to preserve your money. The returns on it might not be high enough to cover inflation, or you can sleep at night, your money is safe. Everybody investing in any financial instrument should be able to explain it as simply as I explained the money market instrument. Now, when people start understanding what they are investing in, they're able to make better decisions. They can tell themselves, ha, I don't like risk. I know that I will do this. Or ha, you know, I would like to invest in the long run. This particular market is volatile. The longer I stay, Pay in it, the better my returns. So they know that it's not money you put in for rent. It's not your rent money that you put into that instrument. It's not money that you want to use to pay your children's school fees that you put into that kind of instrument. So it still boils down to knowledge. Once people have a better understanding of what they're investing in, they can invest better. However, there's a template that we usually try to explain to people, worst case scenario, you can put 50% of your money in low risk assets, things like high savings assets, high yield savings assets, things like money market mutual fund, it's low risk. You can also put like 25% into things like global shares. Yes, you can access global shares now from Nigeria. You can invest in ETFs, while you can also put another portion, say 10% into high-risk investment. So there are, all, there are different, different ways to go about it, thinking of things like age, where currently I'm dependent, and amongst others. But the education is a good place to start. Once you have the education, you make a better decision. Quite interesting, uh, Tosi. Definitely not an easy time, you know, to, to be an investor with uh, all that's uh, going on in the world uh, but, uh, right now. But with the right financial education, I guess you can uh, navigate all this market. Thank you so much, uh, Lua Tosi Olasende, founder of uh, Money Africa. It was great having you on the program. Thank you very much. All right, now, so after the break, uh, commodities market update is next. Do stay with us. This is Business Morning. Welcome back. The European Union has approached Nigeria for an increase in demand for the country's uh, gas amid the current geopolitical situation in Europe. It was made known uh, when the EU ambassadors in Nigeria uh, paid a courtesy call on the management of the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited. Speaking on behalf of the group, the EU ambassador in Nigeria, Samuel Isopi, says the uh, continent was interested in strengthening its partnership with Nigeria in the energy sector, particularly for uh, possible increased supplies of liquefied natural gas. Take a listen. 
uh, Nigeria is already the fourth uh, gas supplier to, to Europe. Uh, at least 40% of the Nigerian uh, gas LNG is currently uh, exported uh, to Europe. We are not uh, only uh, major clients uh, for Nigeria, we are also uh, major partners in the oil and gas uh, sector uh, because uh, some of the uh, companies that are working and partnering with you uh, are actually companies from, uh, from, from, from Europe. Your Excellency and Ambassadors, you're welcome to, to the NNPC. I would like to assure you uh, that uh, will continue to deepen our historical relationship with, uh, with the EU and the European companies working with us in this country so that we can add more value to our, to our businesses in the oil and gas sector, particularly to, to increase gas supply to the global market, but, but, uh, but more so into our key customer base, which are also in, in Europe, Portugal, Spain, and France, and to build more capacity because we're a gas company, gas country, and there's enormous resources here that Nigeria can fill the gap in the, in the world global space as the energy transition conversations goes on. We're happy to work with the European companies to build that relationship and to... All right, uh, Dumebi Yeke joins us uh, now, analyst, financial derivatives company. Uh, Dumebi, great to have you. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, uh, quite interesting. Uh, we see the EU is, is quite serious, you know, about... Um, uh, cutting away uh, Russian, you know, gas at this point. And here we are, <laughs> LNG. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a good, um, first of all, we need to look at the fact that this is some of good news for Nigeria. Um, with the Russia and Ukraine war that has been going on, we're seeing that sanctions on Russia, especially from EU and um, the US, continue to increase. Um, the EU has said that they're going to put some level of embargo on um, Russian um, oil exports and gas. So they're also to, what they're doing is they're taking, um, they're being, they're, they're being forward-looking at this point, trying to take steps to, you know. Um, make up for that shortfall from Russia that they can already envisage would happen in the market. Russia is one of the top, you know, suppliers of um, 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 LNG globally and a major supplier to EU countries. So definitely there's going to be a huge shock um, to their energy supplies if, you know, the embargo comes into place so sooner than expected. Um, but for looking at, looking at, how this is going to impact Nigeria. Um, first of all, we need to situate it. LNG is one of Nigeria's um, um, top or, um, um, exports revenue generating commodities. Quite all right, but the question is, has that been able to increase substantially over time? Can we substantially uh, uh, or significantly meet our domestic demand? I mean, when we look at electricity generation, we're still having a shortfall of gas. How much more, you know, um, now supplying EU and doing that, you know, at a very um, sustainable level. So there are a lot of questions, um, um, you know, raised on the, in that regard. Um, it, yes, the conversations are good. Yes, it could, you know, prompt um, some level of, um, um, for lack of better words, seriousness in terms of, you know, uh, uh, um, increasing investment towards boosting Nigeria's um, gas supply and um, meeting both domestic and um, um, global demand. But the, we, we still definitely have a lot of issues regarding gas production. I mean, there are still issues con um, concerning vandalism, issues concerning theft, not because it's not only affecting crude oil, um, um, crude, crude oil this time around, it's also affecting gas. Um, there's so many other issues. The value chain still needs to be heavily invested in. Um, we still we still import refined um, gas um, products like LPG. So uh, really, how much more are we, um, you know, going to do in terms of satisfying the um, global, global economy? But um, like... Well, it seems the EU might have a part to play. You know, yeah, in terms of, of the refining, yes, because what, what usually happens is they buy the, the raw material from us, they refine it, you know, um, within their ecosystem, refine it, and then they sell back to us. But, you know, right now what they need is the raw material itself because that's what Russia supplies to them. So they are, they are tapping into the West African market, and Nigeria's gas is really good. Um, hopefully, like I said, um, it's just, you know, putting it into context 
and expecting that we're able to do what is right to first of all meet domestic demand and then you know um, um, definitely supply the global economy. Yeah, you, you mentioned the, the uh, Nigerian gas being really good, but I also see uh, some talk about um, uh, barrels from West Africa not really in demand as looking at oil oil yes yeah um you know it's exactly what's happening with you know the russia and ukraine war and um the surge in covid cases in um surge in covid cases in china so first of all it's not only nigeria that's affected you know several other um west african countries that produce um oil are also affected like angola so the what's what's going on now is for example let me start with angola um china um, purchases about 84% of Angola's oil production. So in a situation where they are um, having um, a resurgence of COVID cases, th this is one of the highest they've had in over two years. And with this happening, demand for oil is you know, significantly declining um, because of the fact that they are renewing lockdowns. So demand is definitely slow. Business operations are not as, w as, as much as it would be. So um, demand for oil is significantly declining. So now imagine what is happening with Angola Angola, if in a situation where 84% um, of their uh, um, revenue from oil is, you know, significantly um, declining, so that's having an impact on their revenue, having an impact on their economy. So that's what's happening. Then when we look at Nigeria. Um, same, same as well, the issue with um, China is affecting Nigeria because China is also one of Nigeria's um, major um, oil um, demanding countries. Then when we also look at India, India is also one of Nigeria's um, top um, oil demanding countries. Um, What's going on with India is that India is benefiting from discounted um, oil supply from Russia. So they're, so they're not really demanding for um, West African crude or Nigeria's crude. Um, another thing is... So it's not is, like there's anything wrong with... No, know, of, of, course, of course not. I mean, they, they have to take what they can get. It's cheaper for them, so why not? Um, so then another thing that's also happening with Nigeria is that, you know, um, the EU, um, EU countries account for about like 37% of Nigeria's um, total trade, um, total... Um, foreign trade and oil is you know topping that list um, so with what is happening with EU the fact that EU plans you know to impose this embargo on Russian um, oil despite that demand for Nigeria's um, oil is still not increasing and that's because of the fact that the US and you know some of the countries within EU that are part of the IEA you know about 31 countries they are planning to release oil from their strategic reserves so that is you know somewhat um, um, shoring up or uh, um, subsidizing or making up for um, the, their loss in terms of Russian oil. So rather than buy, they're you know, tapping into their reserves. So that's what's also happening. So when we look at the main countries that Nigeria exports to, and then um, the fact that they are releasing from their strategic reserves, India is, also, India is getting cheaper oil from Russia. China is heavily affected by the um, Russia and Ukraine war. So that's what's happening. But um, heading into summer, the expectation is that demand will you know, um, pick up for for um, West African crude, um, but at the same time, we cannot, um, you know, uh, remove the fact that or sideline the fact that Nigeria's oil significantly needs to, you know, improve. We need to improve in terms of our production level. We're still far below the OPEC quota, and that will continue to, you know, um, have an effect on our um, oil revenue, our foreign reserves. So uh, as much as we want people to buy our oil, we need to also supply enough for them to want to demand more. Quite interesting. And, you know, looking at the uh, price of oil, it, it's like it doesn't want to stay below that uh, $100 dollars, mark yes. because it did go below that. Mm -hmm. But now we're seeing it uh, uh, back up. But what's happening in that market? So uh, first of the... Um fact that we're seeing issues concerning um, supply, um, excuse me, we're seeing issues concerning supply. So that um, is, you know, somewhat affecting the market or raising market sentiments to an extent. But um, it's something that analysts believe are going to be, it's going to be very short-lived um, because we're looking at a possible supply glut. Um, the, the IEA, including the U.S., are planning to release um, about 240 million barrels that's combined of oil over the next six months. OPEC, um, on its own level, you know, has just increased, increased 
increase them, um, all, it's going to increase oil supply to about 432,000 um, barrels per day. Not so significant because they believe that the factors that are currently affecting the oil market are not, uh, you know, market fundamentals. So th there's nothing for, th they don't see the reason for them to intervene or increase supply um, significantly. So um, with all of that happening, the, the current rally in oil prices are definitely going to um, to uh, um, dip a little bit. Um, then we also look at the fact that the US dollar is strengthening. So that as well is, you know, raising some eyebrows in the oil market, wondering how um, easy or difficult it would be for um, oil importing countries or refined petroleum, you know, countries that, that import refined petroleum products to manage market situation. If we bring this to Nigeria, it just, you know, obviously um, keeps us in this um, constant um, precarious loop that's currently happening where we're spending a lot more on um, refined petroleum products. The EIU recently you know, released a report saying that Nigeria might, would likely spend about $9.2 billion on fuel subsidy just this year. You know, considering the fact that we're importing more, um, oil is more expensive, we have to subsidize more. Um, there's also a shortage of refined petroleum products because the countries that we um, import our refined petroleum products are, you know, currently in the middle of um, the, the Russia and Ukraine tensions. So all of this is going to just, you know, Another continue to keep... Pay, uh, uh, fuel subsidies. Ex exactly, exactly. And remember that diesel prices as well are also very high. So companies and households that do not run on PMS or are having issues, you know, almost everybody is having issues with electricity, either due to grid constraints or gas constraints. There is issue, with, there are issues with um, electricity. So people are resorting to diesel. And now diesel is about, it's almost 800 you know naira per liter pms is also high and scarce so um the 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 current um difficult situation which is you know probably continue in the yeah, near I've term seen a, i've seen a couple of households actually switch from you know diesel generators to uh, to, PMS, to, uh, the uh, yes, that were used to, used to using, diesel, uh, exactly. Diesel you will see estates, um, you know, because now what's happening in the real estate environment, you're seeing a lot more of service apartments, um, a lot of um, Airbnbs that used that would normally run on diesel. Um, you know, now people. <laughs> Some some of the um, um, apartments are telling people, well, you just have to probably for now you just probably have to pay for your, you buy your your diesel, you know, or p have your generator or bring in your own generator into a service. service apartment because the cost of running is extremely high. Right. Or rather than do that, they they increase the prices a lot more. So and remember, nobody's income right now is increasing. Yeah, we're still having yeah. that squeeze, you know. Exactly. Uh, so no, nobody nobody's income spending. is increasing. Exactly. Yeah. Even the World Bank recently released a report on that for Nigeria that more people will continue to experience this income squeeze. And remember already um, we were uh, a lot of Nigerians were at the baseline when it comes to the poverty uh, um, level. So you just have more people just falling below the poverty line. And um, the truth of the matter is, when we look, when we situate this, there's almost no. And um, right now, there's no uh, um, medium Nigerian. There's no. There's no middle <laughs> ground. It's either you're rich or you're poor. Right. So you know. And that's clearly because of the fact that income levels are not increasing and cost of living is skyrocketing on a daily basis. Quite interesting. We're seeing the cost of flour, the price of flour exactly, actually exactly. elevated at this point. What's driving that? Oh, still the same thing, the Russia and Ukraine war. Um, Russia and Ukraine account for almost, you know, about 50 percent of, you know, wheat supply and some other grains into the global economy, global commodities markets. And with this happening, supply is really thin um, and so it's having a huge impact on um, importing countries. Nigeria is one of them. We right. spend at least $2 billion, you know, on wheat imports for the country. And this, in, this uh, uh, import, imported wheat is what we, you know, refined to flour, it's what we use for pasta, what we use for bread, what we use for cake, use for pastries. So uh, with, with the price of flour increasing, we definitely would see a linkage effect on the price of other you know, basic commo other commodities that people have. Um, but something significant that I would likely see is that consumers would, you know, re re reconstitute their, their their basket and, you know, look at their, their choices, look at their scale of preference. Everyone now is going to definitely prioritize survival and safety. Nobody is going to... Um,
buy cake when there's no bread at home. Nobody is going to sit down to uh, um, go out for a luxury dinner right. or a luxury lunch Fine when dining. exactly <laughs> when when we could you know just manage what yes. we have at home. So everyone would definitely have to keep you know um, realigning just to um, meet with the current circumstances of the economy, businesses as well. The only unfortunate thing when it comes to businesses are that you know we could see um, um, staff layoffs, you know salary cuts and quite quite, yeah. a, quite a bleak uh, scenario. <laughs> well, exactly, they, they, they've called it the. Uh, the era of the squeeze. You know, yes, exactly. All right, maybe it was great uh, having you. Analyst Financial Directors coming. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, we'll take a moment now. All right, now let's uh, drill down on the market. We have uh, Edie right there. Quite an interesting uh, outing yesterday in the market. Yes, uh, one that we've been looking forward to, uh, but I guess it's just a condition of what happened on Friday. But yesterday was really, really uh, very impressive, especially when it comes to the banking sector. But, but just before we get there, we see that the all share index was up over half a percent yesterday. Equities cap are building on that 25 trillion naira. In fact, uh, we hope it to get to 26, even though it still looks a bit far from there. And then uh, looking at the activity, the activity yesterday, chart had it was just a full full of greens there there was no item of red uh, the volume was uh, almost 225 million valued at i mean and this skipped from about 1.75 billion on friday to 3.82 billion i mean that jump is just so much uh, i hope we'll be able to get an analyst to help us uh, understand exactly what happened yesterday. Deals almost 6,000, going for about 3,000 to almost 6,000 yesterday. This is where the magic is. The banking sector yesterday was the toast of investors. It had uh, almost 3%. It added almost 3% yesterday. Zenith Bank, GT Co., I think, uh, Access, uh, Fidelity, a whole lot of uh, first and second tier lenders actually did this magic. Well, we have that analyst I talked about, Rosemi Fakaejo, is a stockbroker with NGX joining us now. Good morning, Mr. Fakaejo. Good morning. I can see you guys brought some fire into the equities market yesterday. Yes, uh, the excitement is really there because of what the various quoted companies have done in the um, in their full year, and there's so much expectation concerning what may come forth in the Q1. Uh, the banking sector has really been superlative in their performance, and uh, the market is really, really rewarding them in that sp uh, in that space. And I believe also that um, with what we are seeing presently, in spite of the what would you say, terrible situation concerning, I mean, going on in the country in terms of insecurity and all of that. I still believe strongly that the investors have a lot of confidence in the market. And that is why we are not seeing the market going down, even after they have declared dividend and uh, even some of them have paid. So I believe today, too, the trend is also continuing as uh, the OSHA index has moved up again. And we hope that uh, it, it will continue in that state until the end of the trading for today. And then MTN Nigeria also, maybe we can easily say it's because of what happened yesterday, because uh, th that stock added two Naira 50 Kobo at the close. And that's a lot of money for one stock to add in, in one day. Exactly. I think uh, the, the, the approval or the takeoff of the uh, license given to them by CBN mm -hmm. is really, really an added value to the company and it portends a very great potential for the company in the future. And I believe investors who are designing will definitely plug into this uh, because uh, with what we are seeing right now, is a very big plus for them, although it may be a minus for the banking sector stocks. But be that as it may, because MTN has a reach, they can actually be able to uh, uh, carry out this business successfully and profitably. So I believe that the investors that are very designing will actually look into this uh, into this very stock, and maybe when Ether as well takes off, I think it's going to be a very, very positive thing for the market. So I still see that stock going up. It may not be in the median, but at least uh, given, uh, by the time we begin to see their results trickle down in Q3, uh, mm -hmm. when this will have fully taken off, I believe investors are going to have a big laughter for it. Okay, Mr. Faka, just before we let you go briefly now, the only red here was the oil and gas. Normally we see Seplat, we see O&O driving this uh, counter. What happened? 
Uh, well, I think uh, it, it, it's not far-fetched from the drop in the crude price globally. And I think uh, maybe when that stabilizes, we may be, begin to see a new life in that particular uh, sector again. Because we All know right. fully well that um, both Seplat and uh, Oando are in the upstream. So definitely yes. they are greatly affected and investors are looking at what may happen in the nearest future. All right, uh, Mr. Arosumi Fakajicho, NGX uh, stockbroker at NGX, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us uh, this morning. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for having me. So that's it. Uh, well, we're talking about the price of oil. It's going, it's, uh, yeah, quite, what's, quite that, what's that word Laddie likes using, <laughs> topsy-turvy? Yeah, yes, it's quite <laughs> a volatile, but we, we want to see uh, the price of oil go down. Because oh, you want to see it go down? Yeah, I want thought to see it go down. because Nigeria is a crude producer, you would want to see it go up. Well, but energy, rising energy costs is... is and then you have your subsidy to funny. pay, too. We're seeing prices rise everywhere. So at the end of the day, we need oil to come down. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, that's it uh, from the market. All right, thank like you it. so much. All right, we'll take a break now. When we come back, we head to London. Do stay with us. This is Business Morning. Welcome back in the UK. Jobless uh, rate jobs as more people leave the labor market. We have uh, Juliana right there. Great to have you, Juliana. Well, uh, quite uh, another poor uh, data there. We're seeing it, it's dropped now to pre-pandemic levels. Employers are struggling to uh, hire staff there. How, how, do you, how are you seeing it? Um, okay, so uh, there, there are two sets here. The first thing is um, unemployment is falling. So that's a good story. Uh, the fact good that it's story. falling um, yeah. uh, to 3.8%, uh, that's internationally low, historically low. Yes, you're right. This is uh, the lowest level of unemployment, not employment, unemployment yeah. uh, since um, October to December 2019. So that's a good thing. Uh, the fact that uh, more and more people in this country are employed. In fact, in the past a month, 36,000 people uh, joined uh, the labor market. Uh, so uh, Rishi Shunak can tick the box there. Employment is doing very well in this country. But the headline really is about wages. Wages are just not going far enough. Again, as we say, I think almost every morning on this show, uh, Laddie, um, this is the year of the squeeze. And uh, families are, are really feeling uh, the pinch, uh, not just because of inflation, but wages. Uh, the, the data that was released by the Office for National Statistics this morning does show that, yes, people are slowly starting to see increases um, in their salary. But because we've got inflation currently running at 6.2%, um, it's just not going far enough. We are um, going to be getting inflation data out tomorrow. Lots of concerns that it could uh, be as high as 7, 8. Some economists have even said perhaps 11%, uh, which is a, a huge squeeze because, of course, you're getting a 5% increase in your salary, uh, but the cost of living is up 11% than it was a year year ago, not only uh, does your um, increase go nowhere, you're actually much worse off than you were last year. So this is a huge headache uh, for the Chancellor, uh, particularly at a time when, again, cost of living, huge story, rise in national insurance tax, uh, rise in energy bills, a rise uh, for fuel, um, a diesel and petrol um, at the pumps, and of course, a rise in the cost of food. Quite interesting seeing uh, people actually leaving the a uh, uh, labor force at this time in the UK. Uh, but we'll, we'll get more uh, updates from you, Juliana, at uh, Bizing. That's at 1.30. Uh, thanks so much, Juliana. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. All right, now let's uh, drill down on more uh, markets. We see the Fear Greed Index for the crypto space. That was at neutral uh, just a few uh, weeks ago. Tended back to fear, but now, this morning, we're back to extreme uh, fear in the market. We've seen uh, 20 points there. Looking at the fear greed, uh, tell us about the sentiment in the crypto space. We see uh, the price of Bitcoin this morning, about 39,000. did drop below the 40K level and the market cap there, $1.86 trillion. That's below the $2 trillion mark. It's down about 4.28% uh, this morning. Volume traded in the total crypto space, 48.12%. Uh, uh, That's looking at the uh, market cap uh, for the crypto space. And we look at the price of Bitcoin now, we see it's $39,995. That's down by 5%. Ethereum, $3,014. Look at the uh, top alts by market cap there. It's all red uh, in that uh, counter. Well, 
price of Bitcoin volume traded thirty five point three nine uh, billion dollars. We see uh, traders there are seeing that the uh, Bitcoin losing a bit of momentum, you know, at this point, looking quite bearish below the forty five thousand level. Uh, look at Ethereum there. It's uh, three thousand and fourteen dollars. Looks like it wants to break the three thousand dollar support. It's down about five percent. And we're looking at the top author market cap. We see it's uh, BNB there down about two point uh, two two percent. All right, let's uh, bring in Rume Ofi right there. Hello, Rume. Good morning, Ladi. Morning, Rume. Quite a uh, bearish market we're seeing, but there is uh, some good news. We see. Uh, three African countries, including Cameroon, uh, DRC, and uh, the Republic of uh, Congo, have declared their intention to adopt cryptocurrency and uh, blockchain-based uh, solutions. How are you seeing this? Yeah, it's uh, it's a good um, a good news, despite the fact that we have a whole lot going on in the market, Fed rising, uh, rising interest rates, we see inflation in the U.S and uh, the global economy and the war in Ukraine, you know, so all of this, this is very good news from uh, Daro Congo and uh, the Republic of Congo, as well as Cameroon coming out to see that they're going to be using blockchain-based system, a token called TON, TON coin, right? And this is actually uh, in line with the uh, Telegram uh, platform. This is an open uh, blockchain system, which it's going to give them a form of like stable coin which they can use to transact. It's a good, it's a win for the uh, for Africa. It's good for uh, a lot of people uh, to be aware because it's a form of adoption that comes in. As well as that, I also like the fact that uh, we we are not uh, new towards uh, the idea that Africa is on the bank, so a lot of people don't have access to banking facilities. That is going to help them a lot. Uh, as an article, I actually read. Uh, about this, uh, that um, mm -hmm. with the fact that uh, more than 12.5 million uh, in uh, Dera Congo is actually not having access to banking, or about 4 million, 40 million have access to uh, mobile phones and internet connectivity. You know, so I'm just wondering that with this, it's going to help uh, a lot of transactions, at least uh, orderless transactions and payment networks. All right, Rumi. Well, uh, quite a, a bullish news there for the crypto space. But we'll see how uh, the market price uh, will price that in. You know, uh, during this uh, week, we're seeing quite a, a dramatic move there from Bitcoin. Anyway, Rumi, thank you so much. Always good to talk to you. Thank you very much, Larry. It's my pleasure. All right. So uh, looking at the uh, top also market cap, there we see the biggest down there, Solana. It's down about seven percent. We see XRP uh, lost that eighty uh, cent mark. It's about seventy cents this morning. That's uh, down about four point seven 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 percent. So it's uh, a quite a red market today in the crypto space. Right, that's it for uh, the crypto uh, market update, and that's a wrap on the program. Don't forget to join us at one thirty on Business Incorporated. For more updates and developments in the world of business, thank you for watching. I'm Vladi Williams. Bye for now.